Hello, my name is AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I wanted to bring you a video on this is Steinitz Immortal Game or the Pearl of Hastings. Um, it's easily got to be one of the greatest and uh, best games of chess, especially of the 19th century. Um, it's a really great game of chess. It was white was Wilhelm Steinitz and black was Kurt von. Bardelbin. Some people say Var von Bartelbin, but I believe it's Barn von Bardelbin. But anyway, and it, what was funny was that before this game, von von Bardelbin was actually leading the tournament with seven and a half out of nine, while Steinitz was having a mediocre tournament. And it, this game literally changed the fates of both players. Um, von Bardelbin went on to finish at the bottom of the score table. Well, Steinitz had a fairly good second half of the tournament and actually won a prize. So it's a great game of chess. It's an extremely brilliant game of chess. Um, Mikhail Talov said he picked this game as one of his, the most influential of his whole career. In other words, if he had to pick a game not of his own that he considered, of someone else that he considered to be brilliant and really affected him as a player, this was his choice. And it's by a very famous survey in the Soviet Union, Isaac Linder. And this was Linder's third question. In other words, which game, not of your own, you know, had the greatest impact upon you? But anyway, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into this game again. Uh, Wilhelm Steinitz was white, and Kurt von Delibin was black. And this was played at Hastings, 1895. Just a little note: Hastings is a, is a seaside tournament, very uh, tournament rich in history, and uh, a lot of chess has been played there over the years very well known chess playing site anyway without further any further ado we'll go ahead and look at this game starts off e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop c4 bishop c5 c3 knight f6 d4 this is uh one of the more energetic variations in a lot of lines this this move in, entails um white sacrificing a pawn uh, some modern books today actually recommend 5d3 here for black. Anyway, white plays 5d4. E takes d4. C takes d4. Bishop to b4 check. Now the modern move here that does not entail white sacrificing a pawn is bishop to d2. White plays knight c3. I would give that an exclaim because it's easily the most energetic. By the way, my name is AJ Goldsby and I've I for I don't play it now. I actually stopped playing it a few years ago. But for about 30 to 35 years, the Gioco Piano was my really my only opening. If someone played Pawn to King 4 and Pawn to King 4, the Gioco Piano was the only line that I really ever played in tournaments. And it was my number one uh, line, and I never varied from that line. So, um, you know, I know quite a bit about this opening, having studied it my entire life. But, um, I like knight c3. Uh, the big thing, I guess, you know, is it's been condemned by theory for a number of years called, uh, you know, too risky and involves gambiting a pawn. Of course, when you play it with the computers, the computers can play it okay. And computer analysis today seems to indicate um, that it, the whole variation should end in a draw. A friend of mine just recently sent me some analysis that he got off of a website. Um, it looks like it was originally done in Russian. But it has a download there, the PGN. But anyway, I've looked at the analysis, and, and it's done by computer with either four or eight cores. But um, it's pretty impressive analysis. But basically, the, the main line seems to be that White can play this, and he should be able to at least hold his own. Uh, he probably should not lose if he plays it correctly. But uh, anyway, of course, that's computer chess. That humans don't play chess that way. Black plays d5. Now the correct line, the main line today, uh, the one that I used to see a lot in tournaments was knight takes e4, white castles, bishop takes three, c3, b takes c3, and black plays d5. And that, of course, this is this would be called the the Moeller attack. Uh, and even better than b takes c3, there is 9d5. That's that's really the Moeller attack. And that gave Gioco Piano new teeth at a time when it was thought to have been played out. But uh, anyway, that's, that's 
a little bit trip in the theory here. Again, in this game, Black played 7-D-5. Chess base, and especially Robert Hudner condemned that, as did John Nunn. He said it was not a good move. Um, both Burgess and Soltis, who are a little bit more, um, I guess you could say, objective, and probably better writers overall. They're certainly more. Soltis has an immense reputation as a writer today, having published a number of excellent chess books. Uh, in my mind, he's the Irving Chernev of this generation, and I can only construe that as a compliment. Um, Chernev is my all-time favorite writer. Uh, I don't think I would be a master today without the writings of Chernev. But anyway, Black plays d5 here. I, I think that uh, it's, you could give that at worst an exclaim question. Again, this is a total pl totally playable move. The computer analysis of this game will show that Black missed a, a move later on, so d5 was fully playable here. Uh, white takes, black takes, white castles. This is a little bit of a trap here. Basically the trap is knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, white plays bishop takes c4 check and queen b3 check. Or maybe just queen b3 after bishop takes. But either one, but that, that's, that's going to win material for white. He'll get his pawn back and probably wind up with a slightly better position. So that's a little bit of a trap. Black should not fall into that trap. Black plays bishop b6. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 that move is given an exclam by Soltis. Um, it's, once again, pro this move is probably the most accurate. And, you know, that's, again, Andrew Soltis. Oh, by the way, well, I'll read my bibli bibliography at the end of this game because I pulled quotes from a number of different written sources and books. And this game is very famous, obviously. It's been written up in a number of books. It's also been uh, uh, written and, and talked about and analyzed in maybe dozens of magazines over the years. White plays bishop g5, that's a very vigorous and aggressive move. Bishop e7, bishop takes d5, white's trying to pound out a win here. Bishop takes uh, d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d5, bishop takes e7, knight takes e7. And now we have rook e1, I give that an exclam. I think that's the best, the great, uh, German Grandmaster, original Grandmaster, GM Siebert Terosh, he gave that an exclam, and he uh, had, he was one of the writers in the book of this tournament. So anyway, F6. Now that move there is, it, is maybe not so great, um, but it's a very logical idea anyway, as white threatens knight e5, and black can't simply castle on either side because of rook takes knight, so he has to do something here, F6. Queen e2, I like that. I give that an exclaim. I consider that to be the best. Um, several other writers, uh, most notably Igor Zaitsev, and who was quoted extensively by Andrew Soltis, and this line has also been investigated by Nunn and Burgess, they like queen a4 check, and that's not a bad line, but, you know, it's, it's very interesting. King f7, rac1, c6, rook takes e7, king takes e7, queen b4 check, king there, queen takes b7 check, king g6, rook takes c6, and uh, this that's what Soltis, I mean rather what Sates have liked, and uh, that, again, that analysis springs from the Soviet grandmaster, uh, Igor Zaitsev, or Zaitsev, and uh, there might be some improvements along the way for black, I'm really not interested in tearing that analysis apart, but uh, anyway, just backtracking here the actual game. White played queen e2. That was Steinitz's actual, actual move, and I actually like that better. I actually think that might be a little bit better than, than Igor Zaitsev's moves. Obviously, both moves are playable and extremely interesting, and it's loads of fun to analyze either move with a computer. Black plays queen d7. White plays rac1. And black plays c6. That very well could be the losing move there. That's the, uh, the in, an inferior play and probably the start of Black's troubles. Um, probably the best move for Black would be King F7. That's uh, just one line that he could have played there. But um, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, the computer gives Queen C4 check here as a possible analysis line. And then knight d5 and a4, and the computer considers white to be much better here. But uh, anyway, in, in this in in this game here, queen e2, 
their REC1 black plate C6. That was probably an uh, inferior move, more than likely the beginning of Black's trouble. And now we begin to see some really brilliant play. And I want you to pay attention and look at that. In fact, I'd like you to pause the video. I'm going to stop talking for just a second. And when I stop talking, I, I want you to uh, try to figure out what you might play here in case you've never seen this game before. Okay, if you did like I asked, you paused the video. I mean, I paused the video there, and you took a couple of minutes, and uh, um, when I stopped talking, hopefully you paused the video. But anyway, uh, you took a couple of minutes there and maybe tried to figure out what is going to happen now because now comes a whole series of extremely amazing and just really wonderful tactical blows. White plays d5. That's a double X clan move. Just very, very brilliant there. E takes d5. Obviously, he can't take with the knight. The knight is pinned to the king. And if queen takes knight, then simply queen takes e7 mate. So black c takes d5. That That's pretty much forced. White plays knight d4. Here's the whole point of this d5 move in the first place is vacating this square for the for the white knight. King f7, knight e6, x clam. Again, uh, Steinitz called that like a bone in the throat. Notice that this knight here can't move. A lot of my students, when they look at this game the first time, they suggest that black should play a move like knight g6, which would be very reasonable and okay, except for the fact that white could play rook c7, pinning the black queen to the uh, to the black king, and be white, white would be winning easily there. So anyway, but uh, knight e6, Steinitz called that, exclam, Steinitz called that knight a, a bone in poor Bardellovin's throat, you know, a bone in black's throat. It's just a really tough piece to remove. RHC8, queen g4, getting another exclam. Of course, white threatens. Queen takes g7, check, g6. And now, now again, we, we, we see just more tactical blows. Of course, it's, it's mainly based on the fact that the, the um, white now, the uh, black queen is undefended. So white's next move is very logical once you realize the fact that the black queen is undefended. Knight g5, check, very, very nice. King e8, and now now comes you know it's it seems like that here that you know White's queen is hanging, and it seems like here that White has run out of moves. And if knight e6, maybe Black can just trade everything off on the c file, and he would be okay. But that's not what happens. White plays rook takes e7 check, double x clam. Well, in my opinion, that's one of the single prettiest and most surprising chess moves ever played in a game of chess, especially when you consider that it was played in such a big time tournament as Hastings 1895. This is just a wonderful, wonderful move. It's got to be one of the prettiest games of the 19th century and certainly one of the more shocking moves ever played on the chessboard. Black plays King F8. Now you can start looking here. If you grab here, things get very bad. Just Rook takes. Rook takes. Queen takes C8 there and now White's winning easily. You know, it's, it's G4. And here, white's going to wind up with two connected outside pass pawns in this ending. So sooner or later, white should win there. Um, that's just one line. But anyway, after rook takes e7 check there, black has to play king f8. King f8 is forced. And I think it, you have to have a little bit of analysis here because, um, you know, it's just a, it's a tough game to, uh, to, to, if you've never seen this game before, it's really tough to work out all these moves. And uh, there are quite a few sites. Uh, I have a web page on this game, and I'll post a link for the web page in the little box just below the video that says show more. King f8, and now white plays rook f7 check. Again, the idea is if queen takes rook, not knight takes here, and then rook takes c1 check, and white's getting mated on the first row. But if queen takes here, you get a double capture here check, and it kind of leads to the same thing that we already saw. So black's got to go king g8. Rook g7 check. Again, if king takes, queen takes queen check. And if queen takes, then a double capture on the uh, c8 square, and, and white's going to wind up basically in the end game a piece up or even better. So black's got to go king h8. Rook takes h7 check here. And I believe here that, uh, um, you know, black tendered his resignation. And uh, both Richter and Tarosh writing for the this book, in, in, uh, rather for this game, in, in a uh, chess column in a German newspaper, and also I believe 
these uh, comments were carried in the book of tournament said the checks by the rook are both amusing and delightful and uh, black disappeared from the tournament hall without really continuing he he really kind of forfeited here apparently he he worked it all out he sat there and thought for a few minutes and once he realized that you know he was busted he didn't want to lose to Steinitz. I guess Steinitz was kind of his nemesis, but he just simply abandoned the game. And if you want to see what the uh, the rest of the game would look like, where where the forced win, in case you're like you know like a lot of players, they can't see the forced win from here. After Rook takes H7 check, King G8, Rook G7 check, King H8 check, and now of course you know Black's got to take the rook key because he doesn't have any escape squares for his king. King takes g7, queen h7 check, king f8, queen h8 check, king e7, queen g7 check, king e8, queen g8 check, king uh, e7, queen f7 check, king d8, queen f8 check, queen e8, knight f7 check. The queen can't take because it's been to the black king. Black here only has one legal move, king d7, queen d6. And all that's forced, apparently. And uh, uh, Mr. Cheshire, I believe he was one of the writers for the official tournament book, of which I have a reprint, a copy. It's a it's a reprint. It's not the original book, which is quite valuable, by the way, but it's a, a, a reprint of the original book. Uh, Mr. Cheshire calls this a very brilliant and a most remarkable mate. Um, again, that's, a, that's just a brilliant game. And I just want to quickly read my bibliography. I, I saw this game in a few magazines. It's been uh, analyzed a number of times. My Chess Life and Chess Life and Review over the years, uh, British Chess uh, magazines taking a look at it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in some of the books I've, I, I have found where they have a good analysis of this game, uh, which I all own, are in my library. Uh, number one was The Great Chess Tournaments and Their Stories by Grandmaster A. Soltis. That's copyright 1975, and it's uh, published by Chilton's book. Number two would be The Mammoth Book of the World's Greatest Chess Games. That's by Grandmasters John Nunn. Grandmaster J. M's and F. M. Graham Burgess. And the number three is, of course, Hastings, 1895, the Grand International Chess Congress. This is, of course, the official book of the tournament, and uh, it's by the players and, and Mr. H. F. Cheshire, who I believe was the secretary of the club at the time. And, of course, that's, again, that's not the original book, which is quite valuable, but just simply a reprint. And the last one would be the Games of the Immortal William uh, Steinitz, Wilhelm Steinitz, the first world chess champion by W. Steinitz, and that was edited by F.M. Sid Picard or Pickard. And then the last one is William Steinitz, world chess champion, a biography of the Bohemian Caesar by Kurtz Landsberger. Landsberger. And, uh, of course, I think Soltis uh, does most of the chess analysis in that particular book. And uh, those are some of the books that I have on Steinitz. There may be others that I... Um, got my analysis from that pretty much sums it up and I've checked all my analysis with many of the modern engines today today we're up to you know Houdini 2.0 and Fritz 13 and uh, that's just a delightful delightful uh, chess game it's a brilliant game and I hope you enjoyed my video and I hope you in, uh, look at my webpage too if you're curious of, of the analysis of this game uh, I have an analysis on my the hard drive which is much 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 more detailed and it it's, covers a lot of things that I don't cover on my webpage or cover here. And if you'd like a copy of that analysis, you can write me. My address is found on my websites. And uh, if you'd like to support my websites and support my videos and, and my, the, the web pages that I make and you feel like they're good enough to support and you would like to do that, then please go to the PayPal website. That's www.paypal.com and make a contribution there under my email, which is LifeMasterAJ. Thanks for watching my video, and have a great day.